Appreciate that gift, offering of worship and praise to God who, who is so, so good. Well, it's time to worship the Lord through hearing His Word this morning, so let me invite you to open your scriptures to the book of Revelation as we launch into these seven letters to seven churches that we find in the book of Revelation. Let me just say while you're finding that passage, uh, we want to encourage you to join a Life Connections group. Life Connections groups are our strategy for small group Bible study every Sunday morning, but it doesn't just happen, have to happen on Sunday morning. Life Connections groups can happen anywhere, anytime. Now we have curriculum prepared for you. Also, if you're part of a Life Connections group and did not receive a participant's guide today, we can make those available to you. We ran out of stock today, which is a good thing, really. That means we have people who are uh, pursuing God's Word. We actually have copies, soft copies, of the participant's guide on our website. So if you'll go to ibcmanila.org, you'll see the uh, menu bar across the top. Just click on Life Connections, and that will take you to the page where you can download a soft copy of the participant's guide. The leader's guide, the facilitator's guide, is also there. I say that to say this. If you would like to start a small group, a Life Connections group in your home or in your office or at your school or in a coffee shop or at a park, wherever, we would love for you to do that. And we can sit down with you for about an hour or two one day and give you training, help you understand how to lead a group, and then we can mobilize you to start a Bible study group in your place. We would love for you to do that. We're excited that God is giving our church a real passion for God's Word, and we're excited to see Bible study groups pop up all over our city, and that's one of our strategies for reaching our city with the good news of Christ Jesus. Now, let's get ready to study God's Word. We're in Revelation chapter 2. We're going to be reading and studying this morning verses 1 through 7. <clears throat> As you can tell, I'm struggling with the cold, so let's pray that that God will give me a clear voice and that he'll give all of us clear ears. Let's stand together and read Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. To the angel, or we could translate pastor, to the angel of a church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil. You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. You also possess endurance and have tolerated many things because of my name, and have not grown weary. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love at first. Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet you do have this. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. I will give the victor the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God the Word of the Lord. We thank you, God, for your Word. And we're asking you this morning to teach us your Word by the power of your Holy Spirit. Give us a firm grasp and comprehension of not just the words in this letter, but the significance and the meaning for our lives. We pray that you will prepare our hearts for obedience that you would give us this spirit, this sense of honesty with you in which we can confess to you the, the weaknesses of our faith and our discipline and our discipleship 
so that we can be strengthened and encouraged and corrected by your word. And Lord, we pray that there, if there is someone here this morning who has never trusted in Christ Jesus as their Savior, that these words will persuade them to confess, repent, and follow Jesus. And so, Lord, as we take our places in the pews, prepare us to take our place also in the heights of your love, the depths of your word. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, let's take our seats. And let me tell you that the word for the day is love. I think you heard that in the passage. Love. Now, about 30 years ago, Josh McDowell, you may recognize that name, he wrote a really good apologetics book called uh, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, and he's written maybe a couple of dozen or more books. He's also a very well-known speaker uh, around the world. Josh McDowell, about 30 years ago, wrote how did that happen? I want to keep it right there. All right. Josh McDowell, about 30 years ago, wrote a book entitled Givers, Takers, and Other Kinds of Lovers. Now, although that book is focused on uh, relationships, for example, dating relationships, romantic relationships, marriage, any, all kinds of love relationships. That's really the target of the book. That's his target audience. People who are longing to hear what God has to say about relationships. Yet in that book on relationships, Josh begins by exploring this idea of love. And he contrasts the love that we generally as humans express and experience alongside God's love. And here's what we discover. He, he describes basically three kinds of love. Love if, love because, and love period. Here's what he means. Love if. I will love you if you fill in the blank. What do you need? What do you want from another person? See, that, that love is focused on expectations from the other person to meet your need. Is that the kind of love that God has for us? Is that, more importantly, the kind of love we have for God. God, I'll love you if you heal this disease. I'll love you if you'll give me that promotion at work. I'll love you if I can make an A on the exam. I'll love you if you can give me a gorgeous, beautiful wife. I'll love you if, fill in the blank, what do you want God to give you? That's a shallow kind of love. That's a, a selfish kind of love. Love because. I love you because you did this. And so that kind of love is a sense of duty or obligation. Well, because you did this, then I guess I will love you back. Is that the kind of love God has for us? I see heads shake no. Is that the kind of love we have for God? The sense of duty and obligation. That also is a shallow kind of love. Now, I say this not to neglect or deny the fact that we quite naturally have expectations in relationships. Nor do I want us to deny the fact that in the future, God will do marvelous and wonderful things in our lives, and that will serve to increase our faith and deepen our love for Him. Neither do I want to deny the fact that because people love us, we are inspired to love them back. 
Yesterday at 8 o'clock in the morning, I was startled to hear a guitar on my front porch. What in the world is going on? And I peeked out the window to see, I don't know, maybe 20 or so people singing, serenading me because it was my birthday. They brought food, and they came into my house, even though I was in my pajamas. And it was a great, it was a wonderful birthday gift, a wonderful gift of love. And that inspires me to love you even more deeply. But here's the reality of the kind of love that God has for us. He doesn't love us if we love Him. He doesn't love us because we love Him. He loves us, period. And so we come to this letter in Revelation chapter 2, and we see a church that has a problem. And that problem is rooted in the right love. Let's just set the setting. Ephesus. Ephesus was the largest city in the Roman province of Asia. Population at this time is about 250,000. Now, to us who live in a city of 24 million, that doesn't sound like a very big city. But in that time, that was a big city. It was called the City of Lights because it was a beautiful city. It had deep cultural significance in the Greco-Roman world. It had a flourishing economy, commerce, trade. It was a center, not just for the Roman Empire, but for all parts of the world. It was a crossroads. There were trading routes that came through Ephesus that goes all the way to the Fertile Valley, Mesopotamia, and all the way south into Africa, and all the way north into Europe, and all the way west onto the coastlines of the Mediterranean. It was also situated on a harbor. That harbor had a problem. It continued, it, it, it it uh, uh, tended to develop silt in the harbor that made a problem, but they worked very hard to clean the silt out. It was a, a great harbor. It was a prominent religious center. It was known for imperial worship, which means they worshiped the emperor. There were three temples to three Roman emperors in the city of Ephesus. But the greatest temple, one of the one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was the temple to Diana. She was a fertility goddess. In fact, you may want to poke your eyes out when I say this, but, but stat, a, a, a statue of Diana, uh, that statue, she had multiple breasts on this statue. She was a, a goddess of fertility. And it was there in that temple that, that lewd and perverted practices happened. There were temple prostitutes there in the temple of Diana. It was this huge temple that was beautiful, 127 columns covered with gold and jewels. This is the city where this church lives. A very prosperous, a very worldly a very pagan city that gives us a setting. Now, in every one of these seven letters, they begin in which Jesus gives a self-description. And what do we read here in verse 1? He calls himself the one who holds, the one who walks. And this tells us two things. It shows us that Jesus speaks with his authority and power. He's the one who holds the stars, the pastors, in his hand. He's the one who walks among the churches. So he speaks with power and authority. But it also speaks of his presence. He's walking among us. In other words, he's walking with us. He is present in Ephesus', Ephesus is circumstances and setting. He knew all about their context. And since he is the same yesterday and to, 
today and forever. He's walking among us, and he knows the context of our church. He knows the struggle. He knows the challenges. He knows our weaknesses. He knows everything about us. In fact, that leads me to the next slide. Jesus knows. In every one of these letters, Jesus expresses to the church what he knows. Now, this is a beautiful word. Think about it for a moment. What is your greatest fear? What is your weakest point? What is your deepest desire? What is your doubt? What is your hope? What is your ambition? What makes you joyful? What makes you sorrowful? As a church body, what's our vision? Where are we going? What are we doing? How do we do it? Jesus knows. It's a word that expresses intimate knowledge and understanding. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows this church better than we do. Jesus knows. Wow, that, I don't know about you, but to me that is incredible. The fact that the creator of the universe knows me. It's not just acquainted with me. He knows me. Everything about me. Even the number of hairs I have on my head. What does he know about this church? He knew their hard work. He knew their endurance. He knew their intolerance for false teaching. He knew their perseverance. He knew their hatred of evil. We see in verse 6. And he knew their failure. So they're hard workers. They are committed to doing the work of ministry. They have endurance. That word pictures a joyful suffering and toil without growing weary of it. They had intolerance for false teaching. They tested apostles who claimed to be from God, and when they found error, they cast them out of the church. They would not listen to false teaching. They persevered. They endured and they hated evil. Verse 6 mentions the Nicolaitans. We know very little about that sect, except it was some sort of heresy within the church in that time. It seems to have been somehow connected to Balaam in the Old Testament. We'll see this sect again in another letter. We don't know much about it, but we know they were heretics. We think probably that they taught that as a Christian, a follower of Jesus who is forgiven and cleansed from sin, that we have the freedom to live however we want to because God has already forgiven us anyway. There's no connection with, between my behavior and my discipleship. But the church in Ephesus would have no part of that. In fact, they hated it. They despised it. These are all good things. So what we see here is, I think, a good church. Wouldn't you like to be a part of this church where people are hard at work doing the work of God, focused on the true Word of God, who are willing to suffer and sacrifice and endure and not grow weary in doing the work? That's my kind of church. And as a matter of fact, I think that's this kind of church. I think our church is hardworking, focused on God's Word, testing truth from error. But Jesus also knew their failure. And in verse 4, we see that three-letter word that grabs our attention, B-U-T. But. The root of their failure was abandoned love. But I have this against you. 
you have abandoned the love in some translations, the love you had at first. However, in the Greek manuscript, it simply says, you have abandoned your first love. Now, these are very profound and life-shattering words, especially to a church that perceives itself as good and fruitful and effective. So what is Jesus saying to this good and effective and fruitful church? He's saying you have abandoned, and that word means to forsake, to leave behind, to disregard. The word love there refers to a sacrificial, self-giving love. Not love if, not love because, but love, period. It's the Greek word agape. And it is the word that is most usually used to describe God's love. So we see here the love that is talked about is this self-giving, others blessing, sacrificial, even to the point of death kind of love. And we see that in Christ Jesus, correct? We see this love in the one who is speaking to us. Remember, he speaks with authority and power, and he speaks from experience. He has loved us with that love, period. The word first here can sometimes be used to describe some kind of experience from the past, a first experience. But literally speaking, the word means, you see it there, chief in rank or prominence or influence. So we can, we can interpret this a couple of ways. We can look at it as many translations do. You have abandoned, disregarded, left behind that love you had at first. That's possible. Sometimes our love for Christ is like the rose that opens and it's beautiful and it's fragrant and we clip it and we put it in a vase and we put it in a, in a prominent place in our house to enjoy the beauty of this rose. But what happens over time to that rose? It begins to wilt and fade and lose its fragrance. That can happen to our love for God. Or we could take it this way. First love in rank, prominence, influence. Listen, O Israel. The Lord is one. And you shall love Him with all of your heart, mind, body, and strength. We read that through all the Scriptures. Seek first the kingdom of God, which is to seek love. And so what I would like to focus on is this interpretation. Both are correct. But what the Ephesians have done is they have abandoned what always comes first in living for Christ Jesus, and that is loving Him first in rank and prominence, and that love having first rank and chief prominence in our lives. That's what I want us to focus on because I really think, I really think that that's the main point that Jesus wants the Ephesians to see. We read this morning 1 Corinthians 13. Here are just the first three verses. If I speak human or angelic tongues but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. 
If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions, and if I give over my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. The church in Ephesus was busy. They were hardworking. They were determined and devoted, convicted, committed. They were orthodox. They were true to the truth. They were sound in doctrine. But none of these can replace first love. None of them. So Jesus corrects the church because they, they were loving service but had abandoned their love for the one they served. They loved the Word but had abandoned their love for the Word who became flesh. They loved worship but had abandoned their love for the one who deserves worship. They loved truth but had abandoned their love for the truth giver. And that can so easily happen in any of us and all of us. It can happen in a church. It happened in Ephesus. It could very well happen here. If we're not careful, we can begin focusing on ministry and service and mission and worship and, and, and ministering to the poor and doing all these good things. But if we have not this first love, we will never be fruitful. We will never, never be truly effective. We will never be the people and the church that God wants us to be. We must have this first love. And maybe there are some of us this morning who, will like, who, who would honestly admit that we have been focused on so many things and we have done so at the neglect of our first love love for Christ Jesus. Let me be honest with you. The events of my life recently, some health challenges, and studying this passage of Scripture in Revelation 2 has brought to my mind, has raised to the surface my own weaknesses of placing my mind and my anxieties and my what is important to me on things other than first love. Loving Christ with all my heart, mind, body, and strength, period. Not if, not because, period. And let me tell you, can we just be honest? That is very, very hard but Jesus knows. He knows our doubts. He knows our weaknesses. He knows how we can allow our minds and hearts to be clouded by so many other pursuits and anxieties and worries. He knows our weaknesses. He knows how we struggle, yet He loves us, period. And He longs to draw us into this deep first love relationship with Him. I want us to be sure as a church, by the way, this is just a side note, free of charge. I want us just to know that when we are sharing the gospel in this great city, when we're talking to people about their need for salvation, this is where we start. We start by proclaiming the great, miraculous love of Christ and His desire for us to love Him. That's where we start. And that is where ministry starts. So Jesus brings some correction to the church. 
You see, Jesus doesn't just make us aware of our weaknesses and our failures and lay us, just leave us there because he loves us, period. So he corrects the church and he gives them three steps. Repent, remember, repeat. We should be able to remember. I like, I like to use words that start with the same letter so I can easily remember. So when I'm facing a weakness in my life, these three words, whatever it is, maybe it's something else besides my first love, whatever my weakness is, however I need to be corrected, I can remember these words. Repent, remember, repeat. Repent means what? It means a change of direction. It means a change of mind. It needs a cha- means a change of focus. It means a change of loyalties. And it means a change of authority. In other words, change. And so to repent means so much more than I'm sorry. Repent implies an intentional decision. It implies a moment, a decisive moment in my life. And this is a decisive moment in the church in Ephesus. They need to repent of loving everything else at the neglect of their first love to Christ. Remember, what does he say? He says, remember how far you have fallen. As we reflect on our weakness, as Ephesus reflects on this neglected and abandoned love, they remember, they remember back on, on how God has loved them, how they have experienced Christ in their lives. They reflect back on a time in which ministry and service was fueled not by obligation or duty or manipulating God in some way, but that ministry, that service, that worship was fueled by the first love for Christ. And when we see that, we see how far we have moved away from God's loving intentions for our lives. We see how far we've fallen. Not that we lose our salvation, but how far we have drifted away from God's ultimate desire for our lives, which is to have a deep, intimate, loving relationship and fellowship with Him. Repeat. He says, do, repent, remember, and do those first works. I think first works is parallel to first love. So what he's saying is, repeat, do again, do ministry out of love for Christ. Let the love for Christ fuel and compel and propel and energize your ministry and service, how you live as a church and how you live individually as a follower of Christ. He's not adding more work for them to do. He's not saying do a different work. What he's saying is do it differently. First love fuels first works. Those things that are necessary, necessary, essential, those works that Christ has called us to do, to make disciples, to bless the nations, to live for His glory. But it's all fueled by love. Now, then Jesus gives them a warning. Just as meaty and heavy is the word but in verse 4, otherwise is a word of warning. It's a heavy word. Repent, remember, repeat. Otherwise, in other words, there's going to be consequences if you don't take those steps. He says, I am coming. I know it reads, I will come. But honestly, when you look at the grammar of the words, it really implies, I am coming. 
We can count on him coming. He's coming. How do we want him to find us when he's here, when he comes? Loving him. And out of that love, serving him and worshiping him. He says, I will remove. A church has no platform of influence and fruitful ministry in the darkness without first love. If there's that, not that commitment to our first love for Christ, all of our ministry and service and worship will become like that rose that eventually wilts and fades. So we're held accountable to Jesus' words. Will we repent, remember, repeat? You see, Jesus desires our first love. That's really what he desires from us. I read this this week in my studies. Uh, a, a writer named James Hamilton wrote, the letter to Ephesus teaches us that the great commandment matters to God. Jesus identified our greatest obligation as wholehearted love for God, which declares to us that God is not pleased by dutiful obedience that does not flow from genuine love. So true. Lord, Lord, we healed, we cast out demons, we did all this work in your name, people will say, and Jesus will respond, out of my sight, I never knew you. Certainly, as Jesus said, if we love him, we will obey his commandments. If we love him, we will serve and worship him. But the greatest evidence of our discipleship is that we have this first love for him. We can fall into the trap. We can fall into the trap of working so much for Jesus that we have no time for Jesus. He's most interested in our love for him. And out of that love, Jesus rewards. Verse 7 says, anyone who has an ear should listen. Now, wait a minute. Don't we all have ears? If we have ears, doesn't that mean we hear? Yes. But he didn't say everyone who has ears hear. What did he say? Everyone who has ears listen. There's a difference between hearing and listening. We can have ears but not listen. And so this letter is saying to us, listen to the Word of God. Let it define, redefine who you are. Jesus is saying here what Jesus says is urgent. Anyone who has an ear, let him listen. It's urgent that we listen to the Word of God. This tells us that what Jesus said then is still urgent now. Notice the plural word churches. Anyone who has an ear, let him hear what? What the Spirit says to the churches, which means what Jesus said then to that church in Ephesus has power and authority and relevance for this church in Makati City. It speaks to us right now. This tells us that obeying what Jesus says gives us victory. I will give the victor. Victory over what? Victory over sin. Victory over death. Victory over temptation. Victory over darkness. We are more than conquerors through him who, what's the word? Loved us. And there's that connection Again, in, in Paul's letter to the Romans, there's that connection again between first love and overcoming.
I will give the victor the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. That refers back to the Garden of Eden in Genesis, where in the middle was the tree of life, and that tree symbolized intimate fellowship and communion with God, but we spoiled everything. We sinned against God, and humankind was removed from the garden and from that tree of life. But Christ has come, and has, He has redeemed us from sin, and now in Christ, we have right now intimate fellowship with God. And when He comes, returns, or when we die, He resurrects us and we are in paradise, in His presence. And look what He gives us, the right to eat from the tree of life. Obeying what Jesus says gives us intimate fellowship with God. And that is truly why we were created in the first place. By Christ's redemption, He is making all things new and renewed, and He's returning to us this great privilege of intimate communion and fellowship with God. That is incredible. So where we sit today, as individuals and as a church family, how's our first love? It's really important that we go back to that first love. So let me ask us a few questions for application. What are you, what are we loving right now that is hindering or replacing our first love for Christ Jesus? What are my steps of repentance and remembering and repeating? What steps do I need to take to return to that first love. And imagine, what will your life, what can our life as the body of Christ here at IBC Manila, what will it all look like as we focus, return, have restored our first love for Christ Jesus? That is the good news of the gospel. He loves us, period, and redeems us from sin so that we can love Him, period. What an amazing truth. God, we thank You for Your Word, and we thank You that it is true and relevant. Your Word is power and authority for our lives. When we really grasp And let your word sink into our hearts and minds. It changes everything. And so, Lord, right now in this moment, we're asking you to change everything in our lives that stands in the way of our first love. And this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.